Hello, everybody. Welcome to this event. My name is Sharon Trawick, and I am a professor in the UCLA Department of Gender Studies, the History Department, and a member of the Faculty Advisory Board for the UCLA Terasaki Center for Japan Japanese Studies. And before the presentation today by Professor Kim Fortune, we have four brief announcements. First, I will introduce the symposium of which this presentation is a part. Then I will introduce Professor Tamiya, director of the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science, who will describe their work. Next, Dr. Nadine Tanio will give our indigenous land acknowledgement, and then I will introduce our speaker. So to begin introducing the symposium, um, as a whole, it's we've named it Envisioning the Next Generation of Radiation Governance Symposium. And in her presentation today, Dr. Fortune will be posing questions and laying the groundwork for the four, four panel sessions that will succeed this. The four, there will be four more sessions on Monday uh, or Tuesday, uh, depending on where you are in the world, uh, for the rest of March. The next panels will, first of all, explore the archiving needed to support radiation governance. Then the third meeting will be on the regulation of radiation governance. And the third meeting, sorry, the fourth meeting will be on the education needed to support radiation governance. And the last meeting will be on various places around the world, mostly in the United States and in Japan that are where radiation governance has become a large issue. And I just at the moment want to say a bit more about the title radiation governance and what we mean by that. And as a part of that, I want to say something about disaster studies. Perhaps you know that uh, recently there was a grid collapse in Texas with a great deal of terrible weather. We could say that the disaster was the weather, but from the disaster studies perspective, the disaster was the infrastructure collapse. So when there is some kind of major problem in the world, we tend to call it a disaster, but we in disaster studies like to think about this idea of infrastructure, not just the technology, but the social, cultural, economic, political aspects of our, the, the webs of relationship that bind us together in everyday life? And how can we have a more robust infrastructure? And it would be for everything in life, not just disaster. But if we have a robust infrastructure, like a robust grid, then it will make much, even disasters more resilient. We will be more resilient in the face of disasters. So what would governance be? That infrastructure governance, and if we imagine right now, we of course know that there are many, many kinds of experts that we would call on. And some are represented in this symposium. Social scientists, physical scientists, biologists, engineers, physicians, all kinds of people. And plus we would also need to turn to the policymakers and all the people who have been building and maintaining and upgrading various kinds of infrastructures, the internet, um, various other kinds of technologies we might use, as well as society as a whole. We would also want to turn to the affected communities, the people who are in any community, in any neighborhood, how might we all be planning to be more resilient together? So governance is about that process of us working together and sometimes, as we all know, we have a bunch of experts in the room, and we don't necessarily know how to talk with each other, pay attention to each other, understand each other, respect each other's data, and so forth. So our project, and this larger project of which this symposium is a part, the Disaster STS Research Group, how do we learn how to govern together? So we're trying to build capacity enlarge our capacity for this kind of governance, and in this case, radiation. Now I'd like to, having introduced the symposium, I'd like to turn now 
to Professor Tamia of Sophia University and also the director of the JSPS San Francisco office. Um, so, Mr. Sorry, Professor Tamia, would you please? Thank you very much for my brief introduction. I already retired from the Sophia University, so now I'm a director of the JSPS San Francisco office. So my name is Toru Tamiya. I'm the director of Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, JSPS San Francisco office. On behalf of JSPS, I would like to uh, thank the distinguished panelists, guests, and all participants for making this symposium possible. I would like to thank organizing group, especially Sharon Tree, uh, Trawick, Professor of UCLA, Kim Fortin, Professor of UC Irvine, uh, Hirotake Sugawara, Director General Emeritus, KEK, and Nadine Tan Tanio of UC Irvine. We also would like to thank Morika Kawano, Center for, uh, for Japanese Studies at UCLA, and many other persons, including Oliver, who helped this remote symposium possible. Thank you very much. I'm honored to make this address as one of the sponsors and uh, filled with a deep emotion for the 10th anniversary of Fukushima nuclear reactor failure as one of Japanese. The title of this symposium is uh, Envisioning Next Generation Radiation uh, Governance. To approach the topic from various uh, perspectives, panelists in the five session sessions are the leading scholar from the diverse field, an impressive array of researchers who, with a wide variety of specialization, has assembled here. I believe that the presentation, vigorous discussion and the debate held during this, this symposium will encourage us to create a new vision for the next generation radiation gov governance. It is my hope that the, this will also lead to the creation and strengthening of international research network that are so uh, crucial to advancing human knowledge and understanding. For these seeking to deepen international research tie, ties, uh, JSPS supports short-term and long-term fellowship program for collaborative research at univers uh, Japanese universities or institutes. These programs are available for PhD candidates, postdoc, doctor, uh, postdoctoral researchers and faculty members. If you are interested, in, uh, interested please attend our information session uh, another day. I would like to finish the, by thanking you all for supporting the JSPS San, San Francisco office in promoting international academic exchange at across a wide spectrum of fields. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to, to participants from around the world, wherever you are situated. Our Radiation Governance Symposium, symposium hosted by UC Irvine with UCLA and support from the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science San Francisco and UCLA's Terasaki Center for Japanese Studies, acknowledges the Hachiman and the Gabriolino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin, Southern Channel Islands, and including the region from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. 
Additionally, the greater Los Angeles area is home to the largest indigenous population in the US. It is the ancestral home of the Tongva, the Hachiman, the Chumash, the Tatavian, the Kuala, the Chemehueva, the Pipa Akam, Ahamaka, the Morongo, the Pechanga, the Uvatian, the Soboba, among many other peoples. It is also presently home to large communities of indigenous people from the greater Turtle Island, the Pacific Islands, and Central and South America, including Zapotec and Mixtec peoples. We acknowledge that Los Angeles is also a place with large communities of two spirit peoples who organize in fellowship with each other. We acknowledge colonization as an ongoing process. The need to continue repairing the harm caused to indigenous peoples around the world and a special need to better govern radiation hazards in indigenous communities. Thank you. As part of those thanks, I would in turn like to thank uh, the Terasaki Center at UCLA and the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science as well as the UC Irvine Anthropology Department and the Disaster STS Network for all of the support that has been offered uh, for this symposium. We are grateful. I would also like to thank Koji Hirata, the, uh, the JSPS Washington DC office and Professor Yurataka Sugarawa, who was um, direct Director General of KEK and also former director of the JSPS Washington DC office, both of whom who helped us, guided us over the last few years as we planned the development of this workshop, of this symposium. And now I would like to introduce Professor Kim Fortune, who is an environmental sociologist, sorry, anthropologist. Um, we could describe her career just in terms of the places she has worked at beginning with her graduate degree from Rice University, then her time at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and now at University of Irvine. We would also need to emphasize her leadership roles. She has been chair of her department at Rensselaer Polytechnic and also at the anthropology department at Irvine. She has been president of the International Society for the Social Studies of Science from 2017 to 2019 helping that group emphasize its international, transnational engagements with all kinds of work in science, technology, and medicine in different contexts and how those forces shape people's lives and are addressed in media, law, and politics. She has also been the person, um, one of the leaders in developing the platform for experimental and collaborative ethnography there are major features of her career from, you will hear her address some of her research in her presentation today, but at the moment I want to emphasize that in addition to her leadership um, in terms of scholarly organizations and university departments and developing uh, resources, she has been a major leader in the development of theoretical and methodological developments in the field of anthropology for which she is recognized internationally. And I'd also like to say that it's been my great pleasure to have known Kim for a long time and actually first met her in a seminar I was teaching. So I, it's a great pleasure. I want to introduce you to Professor Kim Fortune. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Professor Trawick, for that kind introduction. And as uh, Professor Trawick noted, she was one of my teachers many years ago and has continued to provide guidance throughout my career. So hello and welcome to the Envisioning Next Generation Radiation Governance Symposium. It's a real honor to be providing opening remarks. In this presentation, I'll share what I've learned through involvement in the planning and delivery of new educational programs built in the wake of the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster 
to ready a new generation of radiation health experts for roles in disaster governance. I became involved in this work through a series of meetings convened by the Division of Human Health at the International Atomic Energy Agency and Fukushima Medical University, convened to consider how medical education needed to change to prepare medical professionals for roles in radiation health disaster prevention and response. These meetings brought together medical practitioners with varied experiences, government representatives responsible for government risk, disaster risk reduction and response, and researchers specializing in social studies of science and technology, including some like myself specializing in social studies of disaster. These meetings led to curriculum development at Fukushima Medical University they also shaped new programs at Nagasaki University and Hiroshima University to educate a new generation of radiation and disaster experts prepared to work across the cycle of radiation disaster, from prevention through immediate aftermath through recovery. Both programs draw stu students from many countries, especially those facing considerable radiation hazards, Belarus and Kazakhstan, for example. We'll learn more about the program at Nagasaki University in the fourth panel of the symposium on March 22nd, 23rd. I have taught a virtual short course in the program at Nagasaki University for the past five years. It has been a great privilege and learning experience to work with the Nagasaki University students. I thank all of the students that I have taught for what they have taught me about radiation health hazards in different places and about the kinds of educational and governance capacities we need to build for the future. I also thank Professor Takamura and others at Nagasaki University for giving me this opportunity and Dr. Rethi Chim for first drawing me into the work while he was director of IAEA's Division of Human Health. Dr. Chim was born in Cambodia, was educated in France, then was a professor of radiology for over 30 years with work experience in many countries. He holds a medical degree and doctorates in both education and the history of medicine. I point now to Dr. Chem's impressive range to foreshadow what will be a theme throughout my remarks, the importance of transnational transdisciplinary perspective in envisioning and building next generation radiation governance. I also thank our sponsors for this symposium, UCLA's Terasaki Center for Japanese Studies and the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, and the staff at these organizations and at, my, and at my home department, the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Irvine, that helped us with these preparations. As Professor Trawick noted, I am neither a specialist in the study of Japan nor a specialist in the study of nuclear hazards. I'm a cultural anthropologist specializing in the study of science, technology, and environmental disaster. My perspective on Fukushima is thus somewhat out of focus, which I've come to see as having its own value in disaster context. It also gives me an off-center vantage point for raising questions about Japan's past and future leadership role in radiation research, education, medicine, and regulation in a global planetary frame. As I'll describe, the initiative that I was involved in in Japan after Fukushima spiraled out from a focus on the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear power plant explosion into a wide-ranging deliberation about the need for enhanced collaboration across regions, organizations, disciplines, and generations, addressing many different kinds of radiation hazards from mines, uranium processing facilities, test sites, power plants, and medicine in many different settings. Fukushima, became a flashpoint for considering what next generation radiation governance needed to become. In this, Japan's role at the ethical center of radiation knowledge expanded and transformed, moving from a role as a steward of memory to a role of steward of an expansive array of complex contemporary problems, from a commitment to never again to inventive civic capacity building for the future. Before going forward, let me share how I came into these deliberations in the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. As noted earlier, it was not as a specialist on Japan or on nuclear power. My research is focused on the hazards and harms of the petrochemical industry, 
starting from my PhD research in the late 1980s with an extended study of the aftermath of the 1984 Union Carbide pesticide plant disaster in Bhopal, India. A disaster that exposed hundreds of thousands to toxic gas, killing thousands immediately and many more in the years since. As a disaster still referred to as the world's worst industrial disaster with ongoing litigation, death counts are still disputed today as are living health effects. Many refer to the aftermath of the Bhopal disaster as a second disaster. Japan and Hiroshima in particular were important references in this work from the start. The very first scholarly analysis of the Bhopal disaster that I encountered, for example, read as a beginning PhD student before ever traveling to Bhopal or deciding that it would be a key field site began as follows. Auschwitz and Treblinka, Hiroshima and Guernica, Mailai and Pol Pot's Kampuchea. To this glossary, we must add a new name, Bhopal. To understand what has happened in Bhopal, as the authors say, they call upon us to grasp what Susan Sontag has called the imagination of disaster, the collective representations, the myths, the symbols, the allegories, the images, secular and religious, available for understanding of catastrophe. What they want to show us um, is, quote, how the very structure of modern industrialism encodes the understanding of the catastrophe, end quote. Uh, Vishwanathan and um, Katari's emphasis was on the bureaucratization of Bhopal, on ways the catastrophe was localized and controlled into a series of humdrum acts, as they say. As one doctor they spoke to put it, Quote, the victim has to be processed, carved out, and milked, and every one of the little bureaucrats, the government doctors, the policemen, the ration shop owner, social worker, and political goon had to have their cut. It was the remnants that went to the victim. The mind itself was on the assembly line. Bureaucracy thus needed to be understood as in institutionalized objectification and vivisection to allow for control and domestication. The disaster became a banality, they argued, a banality not unlike that described by Hannah Arendt in trying to account for Eichmann's violence uh, in the concentration camps of, of Nazi Germany. Banality is an effect of split vision, they say, and it is not only in the assembly line, it acquires a more lethal form in the everyday perception of bureaucrats. Problems are encased in modules, routinized and serialized to accommodate the office file, ready to be discussed ad finitium. Vishwanathan and Kothari insisted that it was not the corruption of the clerk that they were talking about, but the ritualized procedure of thinking of the disaster through a bureaucratic grid." End quote. The essay points to challenge that, we'll, that we still contend with in disaster response today, the urgent need for functioning bureaucracy alongside recognition of all that bureaucracy can't accomplish and heal, for example. The need to recognize the incomparability of disaster while needing to put each disaster in a comparative frame so that they can't be cast as exceptions abstracted from history and structural dynamics. I arrived in Bhopal in late 1989, just as the legal case was being settled by the Indian Supreme Court. Like the Fukushima disaster, it called for analysis at many scales, at the scale of the plant design and piping configurations, at the landscape scale where people lived in its vicinity, and at the global scale with the reach of a multinational corporation. Hiroshima continued to be an important reference point. The statue created by Ruth Waterman and Sanjay Mitra still stands outside the gates of the Union Carbide factory in Bhopal on the opposite side of the road adjacent to a painfully under-resourced exposed community. The words at the base of the statue are simple. No Hiroshima, no Bhopal, we want to live. The research that I did in Bhopal and later in the United States at fence line communities here can be read as a study of different ways of remembering Bhopal and a study of how different modes of remembrance shapes what can follow. I worked closely with gas survivor organizations in Bhopal and later with chemical plant communities facing similar risk in the United States. 
My book, Advocacy After Bhopal, describes how different stakeholders understood and responded to the Bhopal disaster in ways that revealed their understandings of what caused the disaster of justice and of the changing world system that the Bhopal was, case was playing out within and could be said to index. The book describes growing recognition of uneven distributions of environmental risk and the emergence of environmental justice movements to address this. It describes the logics through which environmental health problems are filtered and often discounted by medical professionals, courts, and multinational corporations. It details an emerging global political economic system that is not adequately governed by established legal regimes. In many ways, this research prepared me for what we contend with in Fukushima. The years that I spent in Bhopal doing field research were, were, uh, were sober and the sadness of it has stayed with me ever since. Staying with this in one, is one way that I remember Bhopal. Important for our discussion today is the, is the way that I found guidance and sukur in the work of post-war Japanese writers, particularly Kenzabura Oe, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1994. The guidance was somewhat straightforward. Working as a journalist, Oe had been sent to Hiroshima to document and analyze the competing political factions that had emerged after the bombing. His book, Hiroshima Notes, documents this while also being an extraordinary testimonial to what the atomic bomb brought to Hiroshima and to the world. Well, Paul was this on my mind as I watched the Fukushima disaster unfold. The disasters were and continue to be very different and unique, but there was also notable structural similarities that called for juxtaposition and comparative reflection. My sense of the importance of this, this deepened through a meeting in Berkeley, California in 2019 that brought together social science and humanities researchers from the United States, Japan, and elsewhere with special knowledge of different dimensions of the 311 disaster. There were also representatives of Japanese government agencies. It was a productive but frustrating meeting. The need for disaster response still felt very urgent, but the diversity of expertise and perspective was difficult to contend with. We didn't know how to work well together. The frustration of this meeting made a mark on many of us who participated galvanizing a sense that we needed to build collaborative capacity in advance of disaster, readying ourselves to contribute to both prevention and response. This in turn led to the establishment of the Disaster STS Network and Supporting Digital Platform, and later the Radiation Governance Working Group that organized this symposium. We're still reaching to figure out what kinds of collaborative capacity we need and how we can build it. Rather ironically, it was after the 2013 meeting in Berkeley that I was invited to join a series of meetings hosted by IAEA, meetings that were exceedingly more diverse in many different ways. For me, these meetings were very generative and memorial. In an early meeting, for example, Japanese physicians who served at the front line of emergency medical response in the Fukushima uh, disaster described not only being overwhelmed with responsibilities while also concerned about the health of their families, colleagues, and themselves, but also with the need to work beyond the roles for which they were trained and had credentials. They were memorably humble, describing agonizing judgment calls they had to make when the situation had called, called upon them to, to do what they were not prepared to do. The discussion later extended to consider how the enculturation of professionals in different disaster contexts prepares them differently for the dynamics of disaster. In the United States, for example, there's often celebration in, in disaster response and beyond of thinking outside the box to solve problems, innovating on the fly. This can be useful. It also easily veers towards arrogant machismo and unaccountable individualism much can be learned through juxtaposition of these differences. Another meeting centered on different ways of thinking about radiation health hazards at different scales. Dr. Chem drew in experts from his community of radiologists who shared their concerns about the health effects of recurrent x-rays to track conditions like scoliosis. 
These concerns continue to be debated among radiologists and we need to understand different perspectives. In the IAEA meetings in Fukushima, this presentation made clear that things look different at different scales, that granularity and resolution matter, and that radiation experts in different fields frame and see problems differently. And at yet another meeting, we discussed the expected expansion of nuclear power generation in Asia and the kinds of information sharing and coordination this called for. In my own presentations at these meetings, I shared insights from historical and anthropological studies of disaster in different times and places and analytic frameworks that I found useful in my own research to understand different disaster governance styles, for example, and for explicating the many scales and systems in play in complex disaster. My presentation that seemed to have the most impact, especially among Japanese colleagues, was not around these analytic frameworks, however. It was a presentation centered on different ways in framing and seeing disaster and how this is conditioned by history. It was a presentation about how one's vantage point matters, a presentation about how the past haunts what we see and know in the present. To get at this, I didn't share research findings in the conventional sense. I shared images, some with optical illusions. With this image, for example, I asked people to look first at the top of the image, allowing a landscape and waterfall to come into view, and then to start at the bottom of the image, seeing hooded figures. What one sees in combination is that vantage point matters. I also then asked them to look closely at images like these, considering how they are part of a set. I then reveal that these images are from a children's book, Alphabet City. Knowing this, helps, knowing this helps viewers see letters in the urban landscape, but also makes it difficult not to see letters, overwhelming other ways of seeing. My point here was to draw out how theories and frames condition and delimit what we see, helping us see things, but also making it difficult to see anything else. This isn't avoidable. It is how knowledge production and expertise works. A work around remedy is to multiply the frames through which one sees, conceiving of robust expertise as kaleidoscopic with capacity to see in many different ways, transnational, transdisciplinary, cross-generation uh, collaboration engenders this and thus need to underpin the knowledge built for next generation radiation governance. In preparing and delivering the presentation I just referred to, I worried that I was being too obtuse, that the distance across disciplines and language would make it hard to convey what I wanted to share. But it was these images that Japanese colleagues wanted to come back to and discuss, referring to them as my pictures. In these pictures, there seemed to be openings to consider what radiation governments could and needed to become beyond what we can present, presently imagine. Part of the work will be in bringing new content and skills into professional training and practice, but it's also about new figurations of knowledge, expertise, and professionalism. The IAEA convened meetings that I was involved in wrapped up in 2016. A year later, I began teaching at a distance in the University of Nagasaki's master's program. The course I was assigned, originally co-taught with Dr. Rethi Chim, was titled Advanced Social Medicine. I approached the work very humbly, aware that the students in the course came from many countries, working in many languages, with advanced training in health and medical sciences. Most had very little prior education in the humanities and social sciences. I thought thus taught, thought deeply and expansively about what the University of Nagasaki program and students needed from me and had many exchanges with colleagues seeking their insight. My teaching, of course, began before, before I figured it all out, so I also learned a great deal from my students. We really built the course together. Again, Fukushima became a flashpoint for very expansive thinking about ra what radiation and disaster education needs to become. Our focus was on qualitative methods for characterizing different places for, ra for facing radiation health hazards using this analytic framework to draw out particular contexts 
while seeing different places side by side. In working through these cases, we continued to learn that each case is distinctive while also structurally similar and that there are critical lessons in each. We work through texts like this one authored by Aya Kimura about radi titled Radiation Brain Moms, drawing out of it how you approach a study of radiation disaster uh, through a qualitative frame. We also studied uh, St. Louis as a place of radiation hazards. St. Louis uh, was uh, a site where ur um, uranium was processed to build the atomic bomb in the 1940s. Uh, contamination of the site continues today uh, and is um, the Uh, what you see in these images are documentary films that we use to approach the site, trying to understand the diversity of stakeholders and the diversity of organizational actors. Importantly, uh, in, in St. Louis, there is an interpretive center run by the U.S. Department of Energy charged to help um, guide stewardship of the site for the very, very long term on the order of a thousand years. So considering places of memorialization, places of education is something that we return to in our consideration of Fukushima. This is, this is a view of the uh, Office of Legacy Management Museum in St. Louis. We also considered the case of uranium mining uh, in Namibia and the case of, um, uh, the, case of the Marshall Islands. Importantly, the Marshall Islands not only deals with legacy um, uh, nuclear position, but also is buffeted in a particularly harsh way by climate change, uh, throwing forward the need to consider compound disaster as we move forward. And then we also studied the case of uranium mining on Navajo Nation under the guidance of my colleague, Thomas Dupree, who does research focused on uh, divergent perspectives on what counts as, as, as mine cleanup, a question that is reconsidered around the world. Importantly, uh, Dr. Dupree is modeling for the rest of us how to build cases of uh, cases about irradiated places that we can use for our teaching going forward. And this is the vision that we have coming from the symposium that we're launching today. What we hope to build uh, is a set of cases like these. Uh, these cases are focused on um, toxic petrochemical pollution. They serve as the basis for teaching across campuses and become, can become the basis of a shared language from which we can build radiation governance going forward. Um, from, the, from the cases that we've, that we've worked with in my Nagasaki course, it's clear that the issues are expansive. Uh, nuclear facilities around the world are near their commissioned life. Uh, of course, there's, um, uh, are near their, um, their commissioned life. Many sites are buffeted by climate change. Waste hasn't been dealt with. And there's, there's the question of nuclear in planning for um, a green transition. Just in the last week, Bill Gates has published a book um, calling for proactive work on climate change. One of his proposals is for the Department of Energy of the US to dramatically increase its investment in energy research at the order of the US National Institute of Health. This is another question for radiation governance. What kinds of research we need to be investing in going forward? Where is nuclear in the mix? Where is nuclear in an energy transition. The debates are intense uh, and our students need to be ready to play leadership roles. What then do I envision going forward? This in part is reflected in the design of this symposium that this presentation launches, bringing people together across geography, generation and discipline to puzzle through qu key questions together. Importantly, as in the University of Nagasaki program that I teach in, we want to address the whole disaster cycle, being ready for recovery when needed, but putting our energy, hearts, and souls into prevention. There is, of course, much in the middle. The world is scattered with sites of slow disaster, many with remarkable compound vulnerability. 
sites of active and abandoned mine in Navajo Nation, Namibia, and Russia, for example, sites where nuclear waste is stored or planned to be stored, some managed, some illicit, some lost, all hazardous, all calling for very extended management. Many are also subject to the upsets of climate change. Remembering Fukushima today means keeping all of these sites in view. Japan needs to be situated not only globally, but in a planetary frame. Such an approach will depend on transnational collaborative capacity that hasn't yet been built. We will need to work between the silos that separate not only regions and disciplines, but also types of hazards, bringing concerns about uranium mining and processing, nuclear power and waste, nuclear war and nuclear medicine into connect connection and situating these alongside other hazards produced by the petrochemical industry, climate change and war, for example recognizing compound vulnerability and the potential for compound disaster, fast and slow. Next generation governance shouldn't be atomized. That's our focus on radiation governance rather than on atomic memory, on building new knowledge forms and relations rather than working to extend established frames. Fukushima can become a symbol for this, richly polysemic, bringing many things together a symbol that is both a warning and a beacon. Many people, organizations, and programs are doing good, important work on nuclear issues. Next generation radiation governance needs to involve and support them, respecting diverse perspectives and context, always remembering the, the histories that weight them. Next generation radiation governance also needs to produce its own practitioners, a new generation of radiation experts. This is a key focus of the work we have in mind for the Radiation Governance Working Group that organized this symposium. A focus on education will address the so-called pipeline issue, actively bringing students into fields where many of the practitioners are near the end of their careers. Focusing on education for next generation radiation governance also creates opportunities to reconfigure radiation expertise moving from atomized and siloed to expansively connected forms of expertise, from forms of expertise unaware of ways history weight them to actively reflect, to be actively reflective and thus more creative and inventive in their expertise. The educational challenge is great. Effective next generation radiation governance will depend on this, not just building more expertise, but new forms of expertise built from new knowledge forms and relations. Our role as educators will thus be paradoxical. We need to teach our students what we don't yet know how to do. We need to teach our students to go beyond us and beyond the university as currently institutionalized. The new forms of knowledge and expertise needed can't just be developed and pushed out from established centers of nuclear power, whether that be US, the US, Japan, France, or Russia. These centers still have great responsibility and work to do to address radiation hazards. They also, in my view, need to make way for the emergence of fundamentally new ways of thinking about and governing radiation. They can become host, enacting a kind of hospitality that sincerely welcomes foreigners because of their differences, not in spite of them. Hosting that cultivates explanatory pluralism in radiation governance. Organizations like the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science and UCLA's Terasaki Center for Japanese Studies, our sponsors today, can facilitate this, leveraging the perspective they've gained over many years of work in and beyond Japan, linking Japan to an array of issues and places. There will be translation challenges at many scales. We have already seen the challenges at the, the idiomatic level, for example, just in trying to translate radiation governance into Japanese, German, Turkish, Hindi, Navajo, and other languages you see here in this slide. The translation uh, you see here depended on extensive exchanges between people working across different languages, uh, recognizing that neither radiation nor governance translates easily. In closing, I want to return to my observation that there has been a commendable move in Japan among the people that I had the privilege to work with, 
from a focus on recollection of the horrors of radiation to reconstitution, from memory to practice, investing in the building of programs and capabilities for governing radiation in the future. I also want to highlight a fundamental contradiction at the heart of this endeavor that I hope we can contend with together as we move through our upcoming symposium sessions and beyond. The much awarded Japanese author Yoko Agawa commenting on the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki gives us a place to start. Ogawa voices concern shared by many we have communicated with in planning this symposium that memories of the atomic bombing are increasingly precarious today because few firsthand witnesses are still living because of fading anti-militarism because of a general sense, particularly among younger people in Japan that these issues don't have bearing on them. This of course challenges and must stimulate the work of building next generation radiation governance. Ogawa also argued that we, we need literature in order to remember, because to ask people to remember other people's memories is fundamentally irrational. And because of this, she says, political and academic thinking and institutions are poorly suited for the task. Ogawa's argument about the irrationality of remembering the devastation of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is compelling, but calls for elaboration. Academic institutions are indeed venues for rational deliberation and for the development of capacity for this and for the translation of rational calculation into scientific knowledge, engineering, architecture, law, and policy. We need such calculations not only to materially support, but to justify our societies. Working out rationalities can be a way to be accountable to each other. But rationalities are by their very nature limiting extending what we already know. Rationalities reproduce the past, even if the in the name of movement forward. That rationality undergirds progress weighted by history. But what if history is acknowledged to be riven with violences? What if there are inheritances, inheritances that we want to disown? Academic and literary thinking, rationality and history cannot, it seems to me, be separated. We need to think in historical and literary terms to know what kinds of academic and institutions and thinking we need to build for many things and especially to support next generation radiation governance. A short story by Kenzabora Oe in a translated collection by the same name, Teach Us to Outgrow Our Madness, helps with this explication. The main character is a morbidly weighty man uh, is obsessed about his own sanity, sanity because he needs to be able to care for his brain disordered son, Eeyore, who is also very fat. One heavy restraint that the man hopes to cast off is the legacy of his own father, also a very fat man, who spent his last year self-imprisoned in a storehouse, quote, wanting to deny the reality of a world where Japan was making war on the China he revered, end quote. Seeking to understand not only his father's death, but quote, the freak was something which underlay it, end quote, the man addresses his mother on whom he has said to depend to a degree extraordinary for an adult his age. Drunk one night and fearing that he had gone blind because dust had blown in his eyes, the man called out, quote, mother, oh mother, help me please. If I should go blind and lose my mind, what will become of my son? Teach me, mother, how can we all outgrow our madness?" End quote. Clearly the answer is far from straightforward and partly rests on the figure of the man's son, Eeyore. Eeyore, like Oe's own son, Hikari, does not make sense in rational terms. His brain is disordered. He sees things differently. In his Nobel acceptance speech in 1994, Oe showed that Hikari, his son, couldn't communicate verbally until he was six years old. The first sounds spoken at the age of six responded not to a human voice, but to the sounds of birds. In another venue, Oe also shared his realization of the power and reach of his son's communication through his music. His son had found another way. Well, Oe's role was to make space for him, to clear the way for him to be heard. 
I find this to be a powerful allegory for thinking about what next generation radiation governance will entail. Acknowledging the weight of the past will be crucial so that we can move beyond it. This is a contradictory injunction that it seems to me we must take very seriously. How can our archives, museums, regulations, and educational programs accomplish this? Redirecting and rereading re OA's questions seems a place to start. OA's weighty man addresses his question about how to outgrow their madness to his mother. The weight of his body and of his family's history portends a response that isn't promising. But there is another pillar to the story, another direction to look towards the man's son, Eeyore. Eeyore, who thinks so differently as to seem defective, OA doesn't overtly say that there is promise in this direction. There's no rational calculation of what a future less weighted by the past would entail. But OA does let Eeyore and his son Hikari function as beacons, as calls to different ways of thinking and communicating, recognizing and shifting the heavy weight of the past. The sun see the world from a different vantage point, commuting, communicating at times in birdsong. This, it seems to me, is what we need to cultivate in next generation radiation governance, pluralizing the vantage points from which we consider the array of issues needing attention, recognizing the limits of established forms of communication, and redirecting our, address, our questions to address the next generation on their own terms in ways that allows them to live across radiated past, presents, and futures, stewarding us forward in our attempt to outgrow our madness. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to our discussion. Please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A. Um, here, there's one question, um, if I may read it for you. Um, is there a reason that, that is, there, is there a reason you did not include Chernobyl in your talk and jump from Bhopal in 1984 to Fukushima in 2011? As you know, the Chernobyl 1986 is considered to be the world's most catastrophic anthropogenic industrial disaster. Um, I have visited, or this person has visited the exclusion zone in 1997 and spent two days in the control room and has also visited Fukushima and can attest that Chernobyl should be considered in the same league as Bhopal and Fukushima. Um, this is Professor Meshkabi. Uh, thank you for the question. I certainly agree that Chernobyl uh, rest alongside Bhopal and Fukushima among the cases that we need to memorialize and teach. Uh, we, we, I address, we address the case in my course. I think that my, um, my focus in this presentation uh, was to consider the, the many, many cases beyond those that uh, so often um, focus our attention. And so to learn to think about Fukushima uh, through other cases around the world to expand what it means to think about Chernobyl, to include other sites of uh, uh, power generation, of decommissioned plants, et cetera. So it's certainly not um, an argument to, to discount the importance of Chernobyl in radiation memory and, and as a uh, touch point for considering what kinds of radiation governance is needed. There's another question from Professor Fisher. Can you see that, um, Kim? The questions, no. Yeah, um, so it's, have you tried using novels and stories um, with the MA studies at Nakashima? Um, and he's referring to your beautiful use of OA. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear the question. I'm sorry, um, Professor Fisher, Michael Fisher asks, have you tried using novels and stories with your MA students at Nakashima? Nakasagi. Um, I, have, I have not yet uh, brought um, novels and stories into my teaching uh, with my Nagasaki students. They would be um, uh, exceptionally capable dealing with them, I'm sure. Um, I have them for a, a short seven weeks. So um, 
uh, it, it, it's it's matter of delimitation rather than importance, but it, it's a great suggestion. Um, there's another question, several more. Um, the question is, which points would you include in motivation remarks to lessons about radiation disasters to general medical practitioners all over the world? Uh, thank you for that question, Paulina. Um, I think that what I've learned working with health professionals in Japan is the, the need to broaden their education to include analyses of other dimensions of the disaster, the social and cultural dimensions, but also the engineering dimensions. Because as one of the, the key lessons of the book um, that we discussed at the Fukushima Medical University uh, meetings was that the way that health is, um, health is made and, and taken care of way beyond the bounds of the human body. Uh, through our technical infrastructure, through our public programmings. And we need medical practitioners to be ready to uh, be advocates for that, to help design those systems, uh, to think of health in very, very expansive terms. Dr. Maka Suarez um, asks, um, first says, thank you for this wonderful talk. How can we use these tools for thinking about large scale disasters in dealing with small, uh, with local small scale, more co quotidian disasters? I think that's one of the, the greater challenges in building radiation governance capacity going forward. Uh, there are many, many sites of non-dramatic uh, slow disaster. Um, there's sites of, there's many uh, abandoned sites where, or, or lost sites where there are, are nuclear waste, there are, um, there are uh, mining sites around the world with, with um, very, very limited media attention. Uh, my students at University of Nagasaki have developed uh, case studies of these sites working in languages that I can't work in. And so drawing the less dramatic cases beyond uh, Chernobyl, dr beyond Fukushima into the frame of what it means to steward Fukushima going forward, I think is critical. The interdisciplinary um, case study framework that we're using to build these cases, importantly, can be used to draw out and characterize as sites of radiation hazards, fast and slow, big and small, and yet put them in, uh, within um, a set for comparative consideration. Um, one from MK Tom. This is they're an anthropologist from Hong Kong and have been doing field work in Fukushima since 2014. How do you see the Japanese government's response to the collaboration that you have initiated? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that the, from what I've observed, the government has continued to support the educational programs that I've been involved in and has continued to support uh, the Japanese um, science foundations role in symposiums like this. I think that in all, um, in all disaster responses, the role of government is often uneven because governments have a, um, they have a tendency to wanna to kind of control the narratives around disaster. You certainly see this in the Department of Energy's um, long-term stewardship museums in the United States. And so my emphasis on pluralizing the way that uh, the disasters are understood and talked about is partly a, uh, a response to what we've seen across disaster cases where governments tend to want to um, um, uh, kind of discount competing voices and have a narrative about di di disaster uh, that is promises to explain all. Um, there's also a question about dosing or contamination criteria in international societies. Um, can you talk about the difference, um, the differences there are between disaster criteria and ordinary time criteria? And are there websites which co collect such criteria? 
I'm just reading the question here. So I think that your question is, are there international standards for what counts as um, safe and unsafe, contaminated and not contaminated? This is one of the big challenges with radiation governance going forward. Uh, the, the standards are diverse um, uh, globally and still remain uh, very, very contested. Uh, and it, from what I've uh, learned following toxic chemicals, that contestation is not likely to settle down. So one of the key concepts I use in teaching is the idea of divergent data. I mean, how do you, um, how do you make sense of divergent data claims um, so that you can understand where there's erasures, where there's a sincere scientific difference. And so the, um, I think that the discerning whether there should be a global standard, how the, that those standards should be developed and stewarding is a central uh, is a central challenge for radiation governance going forward. So I have a question asking if I'm aware of the. Um, supposedly secret agreements in 1959 between uh, IAEA and the World Health Organization to play down nuclear accidents, radiation health effects. Yes, I'm certainly aware of um, the challenges to international, to UN organizations and I, particularly the IAEA's roles in um, radiation disaster response. Um, I also know that the uh, there's difference of perspective within these organizations and a, I mean, I'm often asked, I mean, should we, should we continue to work side by side with organizations that many feel have discounted problems in the past? And I think my, my feeling is that we need to work alongside them to make them into the kind of organizations that we need them to be. And I recognize this is far from straightforward and that's my interest, my emphasis in, in my remarks on recognizing the kind of weight of history in the way both uh, experts in different fields and organizations see problems um, and the kind of exclusion of, uh, of scientific claims and data sets that are part of these controversies is part of what I want to upend in arguing for uh, the, the significance and importance of explanatory pluralism. So I have another question from Professor Fisher asking about the experiences of my students uh, at the University of Nagasaki from say Kazakhstan and Eastern Europe especially working with or with bureaucracies and teaching them to be more flexible. One of a key concern I have going forward is to scaffold and support the students I've taught at the University of Nagasaki going forward. Uh, many of them will go back to their home countries in leadership roles, uh, but in, in many ways isolated from the kind of professional networks that they'll need to sustain them in their work. Many of them face very, very severe uh, limitations of media coverage of the issues they're concerned about, uh, government transparency, access to information. In the case studies that they build, the original work that they do in my, my course, the, the harsh conditions, not only of understanding, but addressing these problems around the world has just been laid out before us. Um, so, I think a big challenge is how do we how do we support the work of radiation experts in different contexts, often contexts where they're very isolated. So Daniel Miller asks, said I mentioned engineering. How are you engaging with the engineers who build and operate these nuclear systems upstream and down? That's a that's an excellent question, and for many, many years until I moved to the University of California, Irvine. I taught at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is a primarily engineering institution. And it was a real privilege to teach engineering students who would go on to design 
and run the systems of concern that we're talking about. And so teaching those students to uh, think expansively historically to imagine what creates conditions of vulnerability, uh, to think socially about the distribution of risk and to think culturally about the frames through which people see problems was a way that I could contribute to uh, the kind of engineering needed, needed in contexts that are not only technically com complicated, have human health con uh, consequences, but often has to be carried out in situations of extreme controversy, lack of transparency, power dynamics from governments and corporations. And what I envision as next generation radiation governance is preparing our students not to deflect those controversies, but to really work within them um, and assume uh, and, and, and develop their work um, in, in those contexts. So now I have a, um, oh, I'll also point out that in the third panel of our symposium, the one focused on educational programs, we'll hear, a pro, um, we'll hear from Professor Takamura at the University of Nagasaki program about the design of the program there and why they have people like me teaching in it, why they've uh, cultivated interdisciplinary perspective. We'll also hear from uh, Professor Sandra Schmid at, um, at, at the University of uh, Virginia, um, who has helped build a, um, a, program, a program that brings social analysis in the into the training of nuclear engineers. Uh, so you'll want to return for that panel session. So we have from Misria a question. Um, Okay, she asked that as we build uh, more expansive and pluralistic data sets for understanding uh, uh, radiation harms and governance, uh, knowledge from below, as she puts it, um, how do we infrastructure and curate and save uh, those knowledge forms? And I think, again, that's a, that's a critical part of the radiation governance challenge ahead of us. Uh, now there is, as most of you know, there's extraordinary work done on nuclear issues by an extraordinary array of organizations and institutions. But there is a lot of entropy in it. And so figuring out how to just infrastructure the capacity that's already there and connect it, but to, to infrastructure knowledge from below, especially at sites of less dramatic disaster that we were talking about previously. And this is why the the building of the disaster uh, research networks digital platform is a step towards that direction for towards developing uh, digital research capacity, archiving capacity for a more diverse uh, knowledge base for radiation governance. Obviously, it's it's a huge um, socio technical challenge, um, but it's certainly on the table in our discussions of radiation health government. Um, radiation governance going forward. So I have a question about Bhopal. Um, do I agree that the so-called settlement of the Bhopal case uh, was not a settlement, but a sellout? Um, I, uh, I went to Bhopal just, I started my field work in Bhopal just as the settlement was being announced. Um, and ended my research in India about three years later when the settlement was upheld by the Indian Supreme Court. And the, at the time that it was upheld, um, many activists argued that, and arguments indeed, governments of the uh, representatives of the government of India claimed that the settlement uh, really announced to the world that India was a friendly place for foreign investment. Uh, so this is a, um, a pointed example of the way that the outcomes of health assessment and legal, uh, legal processes get entangled up with things far beyond uh, the health assessments of human bodies. And so the way that India's uh, continued effort to attract uh, multinational corporate capital shaped the decision in the Bhopal case, uh, in my view, is clear. 
And it's also clear that the compensation given to uh, victims in the Bhopal case um, um, was simply insufficient and um, not comparable to compensation given uh, in other disasters. I'll point out that the Bhopal case is still being used as a precedent for, um, for the way in which you take care of disasters, particularly when you've got um, um, claimants who, um, who, can't, who don't have access to procedural justice on their own. So again, considering how these cases shape what will come out ahead of us uh, is critical. So Misri has another question. Okay, how, how does the IAA's effort towards international harmonization of standards converge and contradict the symposium's goal of centering explanatory pluralism in next generation radiation governance? That's an excellently conceived question. Um, and in, in starting this, uh, my, my comments, I, I noted in the um, deliberations of Brown Bhopal, the, the struggle to make sense of the kind of role and limits of bureaucracy. And bureaucracy is um, standardized protocols. We desperately need standardized protocols, including standards for toxics of all kinds in, in terms of radiation. But we also need to acknowledge that those that get institutionalized will likely be weighted with corporate interest, with state, um, state efforts to discount the extent of the problem. So I think in some, we need both. We need standard um, standards that we can govern with, and we need to keep those continually subject to question and democratic deliberation. So a question from Aaron Wright. Um, I have a question about the level of the educational initiatives discussed here. These seems to be a graduate level. Are there plans for more general education? Uh, governance from below. Um, so I think the question is not only about, so graduate education, there's university education, university undergraduate education, there's K through 12 education, and there's community education. And I think that what we're talking about uh, in the symposium is all of those, because I think that what we've learned is that we need extraordinary capacity. We need people thinking with us. We don't need to tell people in irradiated communities what's safe and what's not safe. We need to help to give them the skills to participate in the discernments. And in the education, um, Panel. One of the groups that we'll be presenting has extensive um, out, um, experience with community education on Navajo Nation. So we'll be um, one place to begin that conversation. In area of radiation, ICRP makes the framework of protection. What do you think about ICRP? Um, I think that I am not the best person to answer this question. Uh, this is where my kind of the limits of my nuclear expertise uh, become uh, really visible. I think that one of, the, one of the roles that I see for the radiation governance working group going forward is to do organizational profiles of organizations like ICRP, IAEA, World Health Organization on Radiation, where those with experience and insight on those organizations can collaboratively characterize what the history of those organizations are, what the capacities are. And I'll give you an example. When I was first um, invited to work with International Atomic Energy Agency, really as an outsider to radiation, I knew very little about its history or its uh, modes of working. Um, and so I was hesitant, but I think erred on the side of learning from and trying to contribute to civic capacity building. I would have been smarter and more of a resource in that work if I had had a way to quickly um, 
qu quickly learn a history of IEA that helped me understand its modes of seeing its frames, what it tended to delimit, what it didn't. One thing I learned in just my very brief work with them is the Department of Division of Human Health uh, primarily charged with uh, helping build capacity for radiation medical therapies around the world. Uh, wasn't usually in the mix on nuclear power plant safety issues. And so just bringing in that side of IEA from what I was told uh, changed the conversation within IAEA in part because you had, um, uh, it brought in the medical education questions. So I have a question. Could you please tell me what is the latest final death toll of the Bhopal based on your observations and findings? Uh, the death toll in Bhopal is still being disputed in the Indian courts. Um, in the, the well, the, the days after the disaster, the official government figures was about 3,500. The local figures based on uh, data such as number of death shrouds, sh shrouds sold was around 10,000. Uh, the number who have died in the 30 plus years since is even harder to calculate, partly because many of the associated morbidities today are uh, a consequence of um, slow disaster, the kind of continuing pollution at the plant associated with groundwater contamination. Um, so I think I can't answer your question. Uh, the um, I don't I don't I don't know a number. I know the number continues to be disputed. And I'll say that this kind of disputation over like what happened is part of all of the disasters i would studied and learning to see that as something that deserves um, continual deliberation, I think is, um, is something that we need to bring into our educational programs. Since there's no questions, I can use this opportunity just to share with you our plans for the coming month. There are four panel sessions that will follow this one. Uh, the first will be focused on radiation archives with panelists with extensive experience building different kinds of archives um, with the intent of the pa panel discussing what's there now, what's needed going forward. Importantly, an argument that I think uh, will be worth a lot of discussion is how archives need to be coupled with and animated by educational programs. Radiation, um, creative interdisciplinary radiation uh, education programs are the subject of the third panel, which I believe is March 22nd, 3rd. Um, but the middle panel between there is on next generation radiation governance. Um, and a big challenge there, I mean, is to imagine what it means to open a conversation about governance that's across the types of, of, of sites and places where radiation hazards um, play out from mining to test sites to uh, waste streams, et cetera. So archives, regulation, um, educational programs like the program at University of Nagasaki that I teach in, and then fourth, a section on teaching and governing irradiated places. So the kinds of case studies that I uh, quickly showed you that we develop and work with in my course at Nagasaki, we're hoping to build a whole suite of those so that teachers around the world can contribute to them, use them, building our capacity to teach next generation radiation uh, experts. You know, some will have more of an engineering focus, some will have more of a policy focus, uh, but in that panel, we've invited people to uh, help us think about, like if you were going to teach Fukushima in a university course, for example, 
what are the um, what are the key insights from that that disaster that will kind of empower next generation radiation governance? So Fukushima, the Fukushima disaster, a uh, strong group from uh, um, the Nav from Navajo Nation, um, St. Louis um, uh, uh, will be represented. So we invite all of you who are either teachers or work on cases that might contribute to this um, um, cache of case studies we want to build. We really welcome your participation and contributions. And we see this symposium as launching a ongoing uh, dialogue and network. Again, we know that there's many networks out there. We're imagining this network as really supporting the development of interdisciplinary um, programs, interdisciplinary teaching of the next generation of radiation uh, governance practitioners. Um, it will run alongside other teaching initiatives that broaden the frame even more, uh, running aside, for example, an initiative to build capacity to address petrochemical risk. Because one of the one of many challenges we're facing here is the way in which radiation risk and all of the many, many issues around that so often are siloed where they're never addressed. Um, th they're never dealt with in the same kind of conversation and programming of the risk in the petrochemical industry, for example. And so the way that bring interlacing issues both helps us deal with the compound hazards, but also brings, it, um, brings insight from across those fields. Well, perhaps this is a time for me to introduce a conclusion and to first of all, to thank Professor Fortune for a wonderful presentation and explication of the challenges that lie ahead and further introduction to the rest of the symposium it was uh, quite exciting. Thank you very, very much. And I want to again thank the all the people who have made the symposium possible. And I want to start with the Terasaki Center and Marika Kawano and Oliver, Noel Shimizu, uh, this is, uh, and of course, Hitoshi Abe and Seiji Lippet. This has been um, a wonderful venue for us to get started. And also to thank um, Professor Tamiya and Mr. Nita from the uh, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, as well as the other members of the organizing committee um, team, uh, Nadine Tanio, uh, Professor Sugura from KEK, and all the others you'll see if you go to the um, Prenasi Signon and all of the others listed that you will see in our um, program about the symposium. Really looking forward to all of you participating. And again, as Professor Fortune just said, it's not merely a set of events this month. We're really trying to launch a set of uh, conversations, interdisciplinary conversations and projects around these themes of archives, education programs, and um, building capacity and specific places and building relationships across projects. So thank you so much for participating in this symposium and we look forward to meeting you again next Monday. Thank you. Thanks to all who join us and I hope you'll join us again in the coming weeks. Uh, we really would appreciate your collaboration.